our um, our office um, was founded two years uh, um, in 2007. That's almost seven years ago by uh, my partner Oliver Lutjens and me in Zurich. And um, I'll, in this presentation, I would like to show some projects and also talk about uh, the methods, how we work, and to show a bit of the process, how our work um, evolved. Um, I would like to start with a project um, in, uh, in Geneva, uh, very close to a place where, um, where two other projects we have seen before, from Baku and from Lido, were located in an outskirt of, of, um, of Geneva and Karouche. And it was about um, and a rebuilding of a, of a silo of a low-cost housing on the outskirts of Geneva. You can see in the in the center in the center there's a there's an area of, oh yeah, there's an area here with old housing that should be replaced. And um, we knew the client wanted um, a repetition of the same buildings that would be equally spaced over the site, and that was a typical seed loan, a typical housing project, and we were sure we did not want to do that. Again, here in the center, um, it's near the, near the river between Geneva and this outskirt of Geneva Carouge. This is the site, there's a street, there's a kind of traditional urban fabric to the left, with a dissolving urban fabric with single houses from the post-war area and, and this, this area with a front to the, to the street and the back to a cemetery. While we're doing this competition, we discovered this pamphlet architecture which is entitled The Alphabetical City by Stephen Hall um, from the early 80s. In this small book, he collected a series of building plans from New York City and Chicago, and he took them out of their context. He isolated them, and he collected them as a kind of alphabet because they all looked like, like A, B, or C. What was astonishing to us that when you looked at these plans, that even though they were completely isolated from their context, they still the very urban plans, the very urban, powerful buildings. So what we decided to do, to do another letter, to do a T. This T does two things. It has a front, a very urban front to the street, and it develops deep into the parcel. It's the lowest of low-cost housing in Switzerland. It's mostly 100% subsidized with very small flats and um, uh, people living there with, uh, from very different backgrounds and with very different family constellations. So it's a tea that develops deep into to the site, yet it has a presence at the street and an address, and it's part of the street. It's not isolated from the street. It's not an island, but it's part of this, uh, the identity of the city. So we compose this project of three of these keys that would somehow, in our understanding, be both. They would be freestanding buildings, at the same time they would somehow connect to the fabric of the city because they were open angular figures, they would somehow, somehow become harmonious with the existing fabric that was not very homogeneous but very heterogeneous as you see. So these are the keys they extend into a kind of garden. Here you see the floor plans. They are kind of shortened floor plans, what's typical would be typical of the Netherlands, parallel walls, the cheapest way to build housing in Northern Europe, I guess, and uh, very rational plans where you enter a hall and you have no corridors but you go from space from room to room. That's the presence, from, presence of the buildings from the street. Of course, they owe something, as you may see, to the great Milanese architect. 
Thanks, Paznago and Bender. And this is, um, as they are seen from the, from the garden, they have um, arcades on the ground level that lead to public functions, such as uh, kindergartens, space for the elderly, but also the typical public washing rooms where the Swiss um, put washing machines. They have this tradition in housing that you have shared spaces for people to do the laundry, like laundrettes, but they belong to the house. So you have the possibility of contact with the neighbors and fight with them. Awesome. And the next project is the first, and um, the double house, in which we come, which means um, semi-detached house in English, and the outskirts of Zurich, on the lake of Zurich. That's our first build project that I would like to show. And there were two clients that came to us. They were colleagues. And they found this sign that was incredibly small and incredibly beautiful and even more expensive. So they asked me, okay, we have um, four days' time to bid for the site, to say, tell, tell the seller how much money we will pay. So we, we, we get sweating and we build a small model how to divide the site. So the site was so small that there were only four possibilities to divide it. This way or that way. So you could move buildings this way, that way, this way or that way. So you have four combinations. Three days later, there was a client meeting with both families, independent from each other, because they could not, not, not each of them could afford the site. So within 10 minutes, each of them decided on the same scheme, but the opposite side, a miracle. So, we had, and this, we had to stick with this very ugly form, a very ugly volume, and we had to turn this volume into a house, which is very difficult. So, you see the triangular shaped site, yeah, it's very steep, there's a height difference of 7 meters, and uh, uh, the square footage of the Euclid Fields was very small. Each footprint of the building is only about 75 square meters, it's like a small uh, row house. So, what we had to do on the main floor, we had to create a kind of an S shaped dividing line between the two flats. So, to push the stairs in the opposite direction and to liberate the space within. The, the, um, the apartment to the right is facing the lake in a kind of wonderful panoramic view. That was um, the older family with more money and more, um, more will to represent and to show their worth. On the back side, on the left side, is the younger family with two boys who like to play soccer on the, on the backyard. So there were two characters that wanted to um, join in this project. These are our Adri, our godfathers for the project. There were two things that were difficult in this project. One was that it was a very, very strong volumetric project, but it was small. And so, it's a strong volumetric project reminded us, of course, of, of the house Müller by Adolf Loos, with his figural facial qualities in the facade. But on the other hand, it's such a small building, so we felt um, we, it could not have the monumentality of that wonderful project by Adolf Loos. But it has to be gentle, thin, almost paper like. So, we were inspired by the famous. Vana Venturi house that, that Rob Venturi built for his mother that is, is very thin, that's almost like a model. So we build models. So this is the, this is the project model of the house where we, um, we had a volume. So instead of working on the volume, which was not possible anymore because everything was decided, we decided to work on each facade separately. Because you can look at architecture in terms of volume, but you can also look at architecture in terms of surface. So each facade has its own center, its own symmetry, its own center of gravity, and its own composition. So it did work in a way because you can see that the facades, the main facades, are fairly clear. They are very centered, but what happens below 
on the ground and above on the roof is really messy. Huh? And to control this mess above and below, we somehow had to control the center. The same is true for the, for the frontal facade. There we applied in the frontal facade, we began to apply um, pieces and surfaces of stone. It's just one centimeter of stone, like a like a paper, like a like wallpaper that's glued on the styrofoam insulation of the building. It's all it's because it's such a strange volume, it had to be constructed cheaply. So it's masonry with styrofoam and a millimeter of random stucco on the top. That's the next side. We thought of them as being different characters. One more elegant, one more stupid. Yeah, let's quickly walk through the plans. Now, what is an open plan in the, in the main floor, in the, on the sleeping floor, becomes a series of chambers, which is very economical because you have, don't have corridors again. And here, for example, there even the, the bathrooms are somehow at, uh, attached only to the to the true boys' room, so you don't lose any square footage. And then there's the strange world that's just uh, on the roof. That's just the result of building laws. And the so-called basement that is also the entrance level for the apartments. In the entrance, now, this is a very simple house. So when you do a very simple house, then you, you want to make it richer in the process. So we try to attach them, attack this house from all sides and had all these kind of ideas that were inside of the project. And some of them survived and some of them did not survive. This is one idea where the entrance plus the staircase of the house, they um, have an oversized pattern that you can see on the ground, that somehow makes the small space appear much bigger because you cannot really see the end of the space. So it gives a very strong identity to this entrance because this is already the basement. So you don't want to feel you like in the earth, but you want to get a sense of, of ground from the ground floor. This is a drawing of the, of the joint pattern of the floor of the entrance from above with the water and the staircase. So when you're an architect and you don't have power and you can only do what the clients would allow you to do, you can do a project and try again things and again make proposals of this and that and this and that. And sometimes by miracle the client doesn't say no, they say yes and you can do it. <laughs> the other house has that the client of the other house he had just one, two obsessions about the house. The rest was not important. He wants to have a pool in the garden, and he wants to have the top room, a kind of wonderful pavilion room on the highest point. So we wanted to, and um, I didn't really think, but we did want to reproduce uh, the princess chamber, a uh, sleeping chamber by Shinto, a kind of tent room, a fantastic pyramidical room. But the city said no. The, the administrators uh, wouldn't let us do it. When we had sold the, the idea already to the client, so he was very disappointed. So he said, instead of having a pyramid in the space under the roof that sticks up, we will design this pyramid that comes through the tree. So this, these are drawings and models for the design, for the painting of the ceiling of this pyramid. And uh, the client was from uh, Scot Scottish from Scotland, so we started with the Scottish flag and we transformed the Scottish flag into different patterns. So this is the top roof with this pyramid that's sticking down about 20 centimeters and it has a curious effect, a spatial effect. It pushes you down at the same time it opens a diagonal relationship towards the outside. And you can see outside there's the lake of Zurich and the view towards the Alps. So there's a, it, it makes the relationship between inside and outside stronger. A few pictures. 
This, the, the interior spaces of this house are fairly small, and we have a photographer. This, these are pictures by Walter Meyer, a Swiss photographer, who had a huge camera about this size, um, not digital, with a huge tripod, and he, he had to carry all day up and down the stairs, and he had only, he didn't have um, a zoom or a wide angle, which is one thing. So um, it gave the purest feeling of being really close to these photographs, which I like. So it's, at the end, it's not spacious, but they're just doors and doors and doors. And corners and, and doors. Central motive 
There's two floors. There's only one, uh, three, two floors plus one roof floor. There's only um, uh, one apartment per floor. So it's two, three small apartments all together. And again, it's a cheap building. It's, it's outer insulation um, with solid foam stucco. Again, we, we looked at it in a way that we treated all the facades differently as if they were put together separately. And of, um, the street facade, that's the entrance, has a kind of face like quality. Then we got, um, we, uh, the client was happy, we got the building permit. Over Christmas, in not less than four weeks, we thought it was a miracle. It never happened. And um, one week later, we got a letter from the, from the city or from this village. They said, sorry, um, when we put color on the zoning plan five years ago, we put the wrong color on the site. So you're in a different zone. So, um, um, so we asked them, what does it mean? And they said, oh yes, you can build 50% more. So we did a new project. Oh yeah, Lisa, I can quickly show you the plans of the old project. It's very simple. There's an underground parking for two parking spaces, and then there's here a staircase to the left with a, with a lift, and a very simple structure of, um, of a central pillar with a, with a living and, and um, cooking space to the, to the southwest, and an additional room behind the pillar. So there was an idea that you would The idea that somehow you had a had only one real bedroom, you had another room with sliding doors, but in reality only one person or one couple would live there and use these this as one living space where the this pillar would have two functions. It would separate the three spaces visually, but it would also be like a central axis and unify them and bring them together. And this space at the corner, that's a, um, that's a terrace, like a glazed terrace. Okay, so number two. See, this is number one. Now watch. Number two. <laughs> so it, it became a bigger building with five apartments. Um, so the, the, the idea of the, um, of the central uh, facade element turned from the main facade to the street facade. We recycled it. It's slightly bigger. And again here, um, we felt it was really um, interesting how this central element would, be, would allow us to be very asymmetrical here and to have very messy things, while this would calm down the entire composition of the facade and somehow give it a control and a dignity. This is the garden side. And here this element begins to repeat itself. Because of course it's a bigger um, house. And all the things like lodgers, winter gardens and uh, normal windows get absorbed into, into this one motif. But a few exceptions that are in the form. That's the more informal accent. Now this is the, the larger parking garage. And then the main plan. Um, there's a beautiful saying by Alvaro Cesar, which is more or less that all good houses have ugly plans. And we think of this as an ugly plan. It's com it's com it has no apparent rule, but it has a series of walls and chambers and angular elements and L-shaped walls and pillars. Again, it's two. Now it's, it's bigger. It's two apartments. One small apartment on the street side and with a winter garden and a small lodger and a big apartment on the garden side. Again, with a lodger and a winter garden and two bedrooms, a kitchen and an additional room. And we will talk about 
here the, it was an interesting um, observation for us to understand what the relationship between the facade and the interior could be. We, for us, we knew that the interior would be uncontrollable in terms of so many needs and open spatial figures that we wanted the facade not only to control uh, the exterior and to be a face, a public face to the building, but to also play a role on the interior. So basically, all the exterior spaces like winter gardens and lodges come to place within the envelope of the building. So it's all really architecturally interior, but also has to be an exterior. And we feel that um, for us, we work as much on the facade and on the expression of the building as we work on the plans and the rest. And I'm not sure that's, that is typical. At least in Switzerland, there's a, a strong culture of, of plan development and maybe more in the left of the facade. What we find out, why I'll show this image of the, of the staircase of the Biblioteca Laureziana uh, by Michelangelo is what he did here. He put columns, pillars, pieces of walls, and um, window frames all next to each other without connecting them. They coexist without having to be glued to each other, without having to be systematically linked. And for us, that was an incredible observation to follow in a way an example that would liberate us from the from the obligation to bring things too close together. Another thing that Michelangelo taught us that this is now a detail of the, of the same project where you can see from the bottom you see two columns that are on the side of the staircase. On the on the right there's the entrance into the library behind and on the top there's already the library space. You can see that for him architecture was not at all about construction and the mass of the wall. The wall behind is paper thin, but it was about the form, it was about the expression, the plasticity. So this is also what we believe that in, the, in a time when you have to insulate the building with 25 centimeters of styrofoam or anything, the, the outer shell of the facade becomes completely detached from the way the building holds up in the, on the inside. So you need to redefine in a free way what really makes architecture, because what makes architecture will be what you see outside. And, and <coughs> Another inspiration for us in the work was the artist Richard Arschwarder, who died, um, I think, last year. He's an interesting art uh, person who, who was halfway between conceptual art and pop art. Um, he was trained as a carpenter, and then he, he created furniture that doesn't have any function, and that's sometimes too strange. And these pieces of furniture, they are really sculptures. And as you can see here, there's a question of scale. There's a door that's really much too big, and there's something on the right that's like a sign, a typographic sign, but it also, could also be a moustache. And we really like to think in our work very precisely about the idea of scale. So these are some more shots of the interior of the project. Um, uh, that are, this is a cardboard model where we work uh, on the proportions of windows and the elements. So you can see here the, the column that plays an important role in the plan, like the center of gravity, just like in the, in the first project. And then there are the outer windows that lead to the outside and the inner glazings to the winter garden and to the lodger. And these inner glazings, they are similar to, we, we make them look similar to the windows so that they have the same scale. They are they're basically a bit too big and we thought that was a good way to bring the architectural scale and the interior scale to have it collapse all on one level. Some views from the, from the winter garden. You can see a piece of the, of the stone type column. By the way, 
Every flow has two columns. One column is structural, there's a, there's a concrete column inside, and the other column is hollow, it's filled with foam. It's architectural. This is a view of the kitchen. A small apartment. The view from a, from a bedroom and to the winter garden, the small apartment. Now, um, this is another detail we worked on. Um, we are, Olive and I, we are both too young to um, ever have met um, your, um, your hero, John Hay. But um, of course, in history, you can choose your heroes also if they are not there anymore. <laughs> so, um, of course, um, this metal, metal piece that's the entrance canopy and the mailbox here, um, they are both elements that we, uh, that we were inspired by John Haydock. Um, this um, mailbox is supposed to look like a cat that is watching the building. You can come to the cat and um, you can press the button and you talk into the ear of the cat. <laughs> and then uh, when, when the cat likes you, it will make a sound, a murmuring sound at the door will open. And by the way, this is again a building that's for Swiss standards not very really expensive because it has also insulation and render. Plus, all the piece, other pieces that you see are painted metal. So um, we thought of this as a kind of origami, as a, a Japanese tradition of folding paper, of creating three-dimensional objects out of folded paper, like an origami architecture, where everything else is that is plastic its plasticity for the project is made of metal. It's not extremely expensive and it's fairly easy to control. Like for example, this is the central uh, window motif and with, um, with boxes of metal that keep the shutters, where the shutters are, or the, uh, the jalousie, um, below for this window and above for this. And the, the purpose of this motif of course, was to avoid the stupidity of a two-story rental apartment building because it has really no meaning. A two-story rental apartment building has no collective character. It's just too small. But it's not a single family house, so what do you do? You have to find a way somehow to unify it. So we decided to have a kind of piano noise, which is a, a main floor above, and to attach the windows that are smaller on the ground floor from below, like, a, like one of these floating motives of Michelangelo, where he kind of hangs things from other things. So this is, um, this is uh, the first, uh, these are the first images by Walter Meyer, the Swiss photographer, that I just got uh, yesterday by mail. He went to the building and, uh, and I took a few pictures. They haven't been worked on, they're just the first rough, rough uh, shots. And here he, he encountered a, two cats. One small cat that's living here, and one cat that's washing. You see this, the, the fold of the facade is somehow also a reflection of the kind of crossing of different streets that are um, happening in that place. And here you can see that the window motif tries to unify outside spaces with inside spaces so that, every, that there's a certain rhythm that is created. Uh, even though the interior is much looser. For um, one, a little word to to, to typology. Um, we we are extremely interested in in architectural typology, and at the same time we think that there is no way that stable architectural 
technologies will solve any of our problems anymore. And there's a, it's a, we are really living in a paradox. But what we believe in is that um, at the power of the facade to be able to control both exterior and interior spaces, to, to give them dignity but also order to both exterior and interior, so the facade is really not just a kind of superfluous um, membrane between inside and outside, but it has a, it has a figural quality, it has a gesture, it has, it's really the thing that we can, we should be working on in a time when the certainty of interior spaces becomes less and less clear. And I think that history tells us that um, there were many really good buildings that got changed over time, a million times inside, while the facade was so good that it stood out as the architect. Now, then, when you send the photographer to your building, to rental apartments, what do you do? Um, you send them to the building and he finds empty flats, you know? And it's really sad to take a picture of an empty flat. Um, so, uh, can you, should you ask uh, should it, uh, your friend who owns a, a furniture business to bring you furniture? Then you end up being like a, you know, furniture exhibition. Or you ask your vintage friend to send in the 1960s uh, furniture from Sweden. And, I'm sorry, no, no offense against Sweden. Um, that's also very sad and very nostalgic. So, if we thought, if, if, if while we work on our projects, we use the, the models of the houses, like ghosts of the houses, that still have the soul of the house. Why shouldn't we, when we take a picture of the real house, use ghosts of furniture as in replacement of furniture? So we decided to build all the furniture in cardboard. So this is all cardboard furniture, uh, including the bottle and the uh, panettone. Huh? <laughs> because um, there, there's a, you know, we thought, you know, it could be furniture, but then there's also you know, little Red Riding Hood who visits his grandmother and she comes with a bottle and a and, and so on. Okay. Um, so, there's the trace also, the presence of the architect in the building, as you can see. And the stool is a stool, an Egyptian stool that other of you always love so much. Um, we decided 
um, to have a building that is as is, that is working as if it was composed of surfaces that form a like kind of how do you say parallel? Uh, parallel. It's a um, you know it's a wall that you kind of a folding wall that you would place in front of the chimney. Yeah. The former customs may may be painted. So we saw this um, figure not as being expressive, expressionistic, but more as a series of planes that somehow um, articulate the outside spaces, that there was a beautiful group of trees nearby, so this um, very articulate corner is kind of separating the space into two. While um, on the street, uh, the building is very clean and very calm. It's, um, um, it's a housing project for, um, for houses where uh, you pay quite low rents and you have to prove that you live with enough people there. So um, we decided to not to have a proper living room, but to have the living room as a separate room that you could use the living room also as a bedroom and, and to expand the entrance space into a kind of kitchen. That's a, that's a typology that can be traditionally found in some rural area, a, areas of Switzerland, but also in England. There's a traditional British typology of, of a hall with a kitchen. So, and then we obliterated all the corridors, so we were quite economical in the square footage. As you can see, the, um, this plan, we thought of this plan as working like a plan, a rectangular plan of a city, where you took the scissors and you cut them out according to your need. And you grew that plan into the outer form of the building. So our thinking about the outer form of the building was very separate from the development of the interior plan. And we, it took us months to have these two clash and to rework the relationship. Because it was so clear that this building form was the best. And it was so clear that these apartments should be like that. So we just let them clash for, for a long time. It was a lot of work. So here you can, see, you can uh, quickly see a typical apartment. You enter and you're directly in a kind of hall, and a kitchen hall uh, with a table and an outside space. And then you have a slightly larger room that could double as a living room, but also as a sleeping room. And the other space rooms are just the light. So it's a very compact, very economical system. This shows, that again, there's a column. It's a load bearing column of concrete um, that's um, somehow giving uh, an importance to the point where the three privileged spaces of this otherwise very homogeneous structure come together, which is, of course, the, the balcony, the lodger, the living room, with the kitchen, or the, the kitchen room, plus this so-called living room, the largest bedroom. So somehow there, where the pillar is placed, the most the highest degree of intensity and public character is expressed. For the facades, we were we had an odd couple of inspirations. <laughs> it was a um, Brunelleschi's um, a foundling's house in Florence, which we love for the very interesting relationship between surface and structure. In this building, the, the plastic surface and the molding of the building of the windows and the horizontal lines, none of both. Not one or the other is dominating, but they are in a very subtle equilibrium. So it's not that the molding separated the surface which is just filled up, but somehow these elements seem to float on the surface. The other inspiration was how the building should feel like. And we looked again at, at, the, at Robert Venturi's work, the Lee Beach House from 1967. It's clad in shingles. Very simple, very cheap American material. So um, we decided to um, to make a, a facade out of large um, fiber concrete shingles. 
So the, the company of Etani, they make shingles that are about a centimeter thick and they are large and they can be almost white. And the structure that is kind of separating them is in wood, in painted wood. So there's a that's a horizontal line that separates the two main floors in two and two. And why did we do that? We did that because the, the site is slightly inclined and the ground floor is slowly going and disappearing into the ground. So it would have been terrible to have a base floor that somehow disappears and to have people living in the base of a building. So we made it, we wanted to create a kind of equal relationship between up and down and to have the center of gravity of the building in the center. This is the side of the garden. Um, the, I think it's almost the last project. It's um, a direct commission to replace a building from the 1930s in a block structure in Zurich. Um, I think um, Nicola, uh, yeah, Nicola, you worked on this um, competition yes. that happens. I win a prize in the competition. Here, here, right. here on the yeah, Nicola won a prize in this competition here, and we are uh, designing the building that is that is attaching to the side of the competition. It is the last urban block building in Zurich. Above. There's the city, the dense city, the structure of the 19th century. Here, there's the classical elements of the modern city, the stadium and the slaughterhouse. Be beyond the slaughterhouse, there's just straw. <laughs> <laughs> so, you have two faces. You have one face that's facing the slaughterhouse and the straw. And you have another face that's gentle to the garden, to the city. So, it's a classical view of treating two facades in a very different way. And of course you spend the money on the severe facade, looking at the slaughterhouse, and the other facade will be cheap. So this is a, a project that, if it was Greek, we thought it was more Spartan than Athens. We think of it like a helmet, something that's facing the, the, the lives of all these animals that end every day, you know? and the smell, you know? of the slaughterhouse that is kind of carried by the wind across. And of course, um, it is in a way, it's also facing the stadium, so it has a good friend, it's the, uh, the, the, uh, the Corbusier building, the Rue Monitor, it's also facing the stadium in Paris, and this is the less gentle version of it. Here you see, to the left, that's the Corbusier inspiration. It's an incredible, complex building that is developing a, a, its facade from floor to floor and transforming itself. And uh, so we were interested in two things. We were interested in kind of skin-like quality of the building and its fine structure. So, of course, uh, the July was incredibly important because as opposed to later Renaissance Palazzi, everything that is done here, designed here in terms of stone and pillars, everything has this incredible artificiality and precision and kind of almost a, a tenseness that's, that later became more naturalistic in architecture. So this is the section, again, urbanistically, to the left, the baby was pushing towards the slaughterhouse in the open plain, while on the back side it's kind of stepping gently down into the, into the courtyard. And of course, as you can imagine, every, every level has its own character, its own, uh, own relationship to the outside. The outside of this, this uh, building is clad in, in cast fiber cement panels that are like a rustication. A rustication is a, is, a, is, a, is, is a plasticity of a building that's designed, that's not made, that's not, that doesn't come out of the construction, but it comes out of the planned appearance of the building. I think you were mentioning the, the rustication from Ferrara, didn't you? Yeah. But you were there. For the commercial center. Exactly. So we turn around. And from the back side, 
side it has a kind of a relaxation. You know? It's a, a, again an outer insulation facade with with steel and very simple steel balconies and out and outlying drain pipes and all the elements of the city that would make it less important and more relaxed. So we walk quickly through. There's a parking, and then it's like a thing developing on the different levels. Let's start with the uh, with the first floor. Here you can see it's a it's a slight it's a basically a symmetrical plan, but in reality it's asymmetrical. It's based upon the idea that there's that each apartment has a kind of apartment in itself, a small private suite that goes from one facade to the other. There's a sitting room, a dressing room, and a, and a long bathroom. And it has something to do with the noise situation at the place, but it's also creating another layer of privacy. And as you can see, this is repeated on both sides, but the kitchens are on di at different places. There's, there's an equilibrium between the, the symmetry and the asymmetry of the plan, which we find really important, because a strong symmetry would not have any significance in this plan. So this is the next floor with a huge uh, terrace. There's always this uh, kind of apartment figure where everything comes together. And, and in terms of um, in terms of urbanism, you can see that it's constructed the building. It's constructed of, of concrete walls here, left and right, and then there are pillars. And these pillars, towards the open plain, they stand against it. They stand against they are parallel to the facade, but you can still pass between the facade and the pillars. They stay, stand against the power of this open plane, while in the depth of the building, the pillars, they turn by 90 degrees, and they become gentle and let the, let the, let the space flow. So it's a spatial idea that somehow both a flow lever, where the, where the space flows freely, and a kind of um, a classical a cellular plan. These are a few model shots from inside. Construction will start in September. Um, to end this um, presentation, I want to show a joke. Um, it's um, not a serious project. We did it for a small exhibition a few years ago kind of an idea of how you could densify in 2046 the street in Zurich. We thought it was a really stupid um, exhibition. And, um, and but we thought of it, uh, and we thought that we could work on the question of, of limit and eternity and, and figure qualities. So we created a kind of Venus of Milo um, uh, building that has a very strong bottom and a very strong, very heavy top, and some kind of um, figure quality in between. The grids are not matching, each grid is itself. <laughs>